Uh, thank you all for joining us in our roundtable session here from Imagine Communications. My name is John Myatt. I'm the CTO and Director of Product Management for the Networking and Infrastructure team at Imagine. And networking and infrastructure is interesting these days because it's everything from good old distribution amplifiers and you know little stuff like that all the way to the you know newest IP infrastructures. And we'll be talking about the whole transition of the world and how we got to here. Now, interestingly, one of the roles I play in public is representing Imagine in a number of different standards bodies. And um, if you put on your Wayback Machine hat and you think about where we've been for the last 20 years, if you think back to 20 years ago, where were we? So in terms of signals that we sent around our plant, SMPTE and ITU had come up with a lot of really good video standards that defined very exactly what is, you know, what does the video look like, how many pixels there are, what the colors meant. Um, the reason that we can interchange programming all around the world is because of those documents. And likewise, the SDI interconnect and the MPEG-2 standard for you know, video compression were all, you know, nailed down standards, internationally recognized. And then there was tape and tape formats. We had lots to choose from, you know, D1, D2, D3, D5, D7, D6, um, plus a bunch of others. Now, in the control protocol world, things were less standardized. We had lots of protocols. You know, every router maker had a protocol. Every tape deck maker had a protocol for the controls. There was VDCP, which was the very first uh, video disk control protocol for controlling servers, which was modeled on the tape deck protocols. Um, but they were all, for sake of argument, vendor proprietary protocols. There wasn't as though, it wasn't like there was a standards body that standardized any of these, with the exception of SNMP. Um, but even there, SNMP is a language, not a, you know, not a full solution. And then for status and monitoring and alarming, we inherited from the IT industry log files, SNMP, and syslog. And that was, you know, those are all written down standard things. Now, fast forward 10 years or so, we had migrated SDI to 3 gig. We were starting to do SDI over IP with 2022.6. MPEG-2 had become H.264. And there was kind of a bloom of file formats, plus MXF, which was a standardized container file format. On the control protocol side, there were lots more vendor proprietary protocols, lots of APIs, but still not a lot of standards motion on actually standardizing anything. And status monitoring alarming, we still had you know, SNMP and syslog and you know, good old files. Now, here we are in 2020, 2021 now. We have moved the ball on interconnect to SMPTE 2110. We've now adopted JPEG XS as well in terms of you know, long haul transport. MXF has been joined by IMF as a very standardized file interchange format. On the control protocol side, a little bit of work has happened. So on the control protocol side, AMWA has produced NMOS, which if in the context of what came before is quite an achievement because NMOS is a internationally recognized, all vendors doing it the same way, control protocol for switching signals in an IP environment. There's still a lot of other vendor APIs and there's a lot of work that could be done in the future to further standardize control protocols. And I think that the growth of the industry depends on us doing more of that in the future. And for status monitoring and alarming, we still have, 20 years later, SNMP and syslog as the predominant things. Again, look forward to some evolution in that area. All that said, the television industry is going through four simultaneous transitions. Um, the first is this technology transition under the hood of carrying the signals around the plant in IP versus SDI. Um, in the live production industry, this was driven by scale, you know, needing to be bigger than is convenient in an SDI router, and equally driven by the need to 
use UHD or to accommodate UHD, at least in some ways. Now, in the linear playout industry, a very similar need for scale drives an IP transition there. You can build bigger and bigger systems with more and more multi-viewers and more and more signals flying around using IP than is convenient in SDI. So both those industries are along this transition for maybe slightly different driving reasons, but both relate to scale. Now, UHD is a big transition for the production industry. You can shoot in UHD and make a beautiful production, and the HD version at the end still looks better. So there is a lot of value to producing in UHD, even if you don't have a delivery mechanism right now, because you may have a delivery mechanism in the future. Um, in the linear playout world, UHD is a consideration if you need to make a UHD channel, but that really implies that you have a way to reach consumers. So you don't tend to build the UHD playout center or playout channel until you have a path to get it delivered. So maybe that adoption and playout is a little bit further behind, but on the production side, anybody building a new production studio has to think through the question, do I need to do UHD in the future, even if I don't need to do it on the first day? Do I need to accommodate it in infrastructure decisions? Now, HDR sort of goes hand in hand with UHD. You can do HDR on 1080p as well, and there is a, a view that that is a great solution, um, and it is. It can make beautiful looking television. So again, this transition from SDR to HDR in the live production world has, I think, a little bit been slowed down by COVID. This is one of the things that maybe we haven't done as much experimentation in the last year as would have happened in the realm of HDR shooting and HDR production, because it really does involve kind of seeing what you're doing in a way that, you know, for HD, we sort of know what it's going to look like. Um, linear playout, I think HDR and UHD go hand in hand. You wouldn't build a UHD playout system that didn't also support HDR. Even if you're not doing HDR on the first, sh first show or the first day, you know it's coming and you, you have to kind of plan on it. Now, where there's an interesting difference is on um, the transition to software-based and cloud. Um, for quite a few years, playout in playout systems, ingest systems have been software-based. Um, this has been the case in our product line for quite a long time. So the notion of moving them to running in a hosted environment or in a data center environment came very naturally. And if you look at the adoption in the playout world, you'll see that you know, a large number of TV channels you watch today are coming from hosted software environments. Some of them are in public cloud, some of them are in private cloud, which could mean a lot of things, but they fundamentally, the shift to doing you know, linear playouts and ingests and things in a software hosted, maybe cloudified environment is you know, pretty well along. Now on the production side, less so. If you dial your brain back to pre-COVID, you know, late 2019, there was the beginning of a lot of talk about doing parts of production in the cloud. Um, Panasonic driving their you know, sort of software-based switcher. Um, EVS had also done some work on software-based switchers. Um, now, you know, Grass and other people similarly, um, we don't make switchers, but it's fun to watch. So the you know, transition of production you know, true production into cloud environment was starting up even before COVID. COVID has certainly put some interesting pressures on it. And so I think that that's an area we'll see a lot of growth in the next year. But if you look at, you know, where are we today, that's something that's starting and is, you know, I think very promising. Now, of course, all this to say, what are we doing about it? Because at Imagine, you know, we, we see these trends, we participate in these trends. And so our vision is to drive standards and to drive the creation and the evolution of standards. And of course, we do make some products. Now, we have, as I mentioned, you know, networking infrastructure. So we have a lot of traditional stuff, you know, the routers that route SDI. And SDI is a great solution if it solves the problem you need to solve. Um, 
But our focus these days is really on two areas. It's on the control systems that control the IP endpoints and make it all act like a system, you know, systemizing the IP infrastructure so that it has the operational look and feel of a routing system that's under good control. And then our other focus is on network-based processing. So once the signals are in IP, the, the main idea is how do you do the traditional things you did to them, up conversion, down conversion, synchronizing, adding graphics, um, shuffling audio, audio processing, you know, loudness control, all those things. So our focus in our network-based processors has been to do the same things we did traditionally in little, you know, individual module kind of modular processors, but to do them in a soft modular platform approach. So SNP is a platform and you can use it on the first day to just do simple IP SDI, you know, transition gateway kind of stuff, but it has a bunch of other software features that get turned on over time. So as your project evolves or as your plan proceeds, you can turn on different features. It's basically a modular product, just like we used to make, except there's no little hardware modules. Instead, there's software modules and you turn them on as you need them. Um, it's a very different approach, um, but it has the advantages of providing a simple supply chain and providing a simple execution environment. So you can build out a system today and as your needs change, you can reprogram the hardware to do the thing you need next. All in all, we've seen customers that adopted SNP early on, you know, three years ago or so, do this and actually turn on new keys and new features as their needs have evolved over the life of the project. Um, the other big thing that we approach with SNP is power budget and space budget and overall economics, because, you know, software-based processing is great, but for call them simple transformations or transformations that are very pixel implementation heavy. Um, this, you know, one RU box coming in at 350 watts can do eight UHD signals. Whereas trying to do that all in pure software or sending it off to a data center and pulling it back from the data center so that you could process it in a remote data center, um, the economics are not, not as favorable from a power and you know, carbon footprint and all these other metrics. So we think it's a great solution for the class of problems that it suits, which are frankly the traditional infrastructure challenges, synchronization, audio mapping, audio manipulation, video manipulation, color processing. And by the way, as you go to HDR, you'll find a lot of needs for color adjustment and color processing. The ability to transform signals, you know, take the SDR signal that came from your archive, apply the right HDR mapping curve to it, and then integrate it into your UHD production. Um, that's a very common workflow that SNP does, you know, really well. So that's the, you know, what are we doing about these industry trends? So what's the state of play? The state of play right now in April of 2021 is that IP2110 and MOS facilities, they work great. We've built a lot of them. Other vendors have built a lot of them. There's a lot of facilities on the air making television today that are using ST2110 and NMOS to do it. And they work and there's more of them every month. And if you watch, you know, watch the industry, you'll see them marching along. Now, in the time that we've been doing this, Moore's Law keeps marching along. So Intel and AMD are in a head-to-head -head battle and they're each making bigger chips with smaller transistors and more cores on a die every day. And it's really incredible what's happened if you dial back your window to 10 years ago and look at the evolution of what can fit on a chip. Um, same thing's happening in the switch industry. If you watch Cisco and Arista and their, you know, the people who compete with them, they're packing more and more bandwidth into every switch port every day. And in the, you know, when we started this in say 2012 or 2013, 10 gig switches were expensive but existed. And 10 became 40, 40 became 100, 100 has now become 400 in less than 10 years. 
And that's a huge evolution, right? That's 40 times the bandwidth per port. And the number of ports is really driven by the size of the package. So you can go to you know, fiberstore.com and find a switch with 32 400 gig ports for $10,000. Now, that doesn't come with software, and that's a super important you know, little tidbit that you have to remember the software is where the value is. But from a hardware evolution standpoint, it's just crazy what's happened. And by the way, the cost of the optics and other things has come down at a really steep curve. So that Moore's law factor is what enables all of this. It's what enables the cloud. It's what enables the IP infrastructure is that you know, the cost of all these things is driven by an economic system from the IT industry. For once, television is not the leading adopter of these technologies. Television is an important adopter, but not the leader. And this helps us all in terms of economics and how our systems roll out. Now, equally, the cloud is real and the cloud works great and it's proven out. You know, we're running playout systems in the cloud or running other things in the cloud. And again, the television industry did not invent the cloud. The cloud was developed and exists for thousands of different industries across lots of different segments. So the idea that we can do video production in the cloud, of course we can. The idea that we can do video channel playout in the cloud, of course we can. And we're in, frankly, the optimization phase of that. How do we do it better? How do we do it more cost effectively? How do we manage it better? Um, because it's you know that transition from you can do it to you can do it well to you can do it repeatedly and with low risk. That's the transition that we're going through for you know, all these cloud-based systems as they relate to television. Now, importantly, I'll always say SDI still works too. You know, I, we have other children, right? And SDI makes sense for applications that it suits. Um, ultimately, project investment decisions are driven by a lot of factors and you have to plan future needs. So if you need to do UHD in the future, if you need to do HDR in the future, if you expect to do those things, then you need to plan an infrastructure that gets you there. So that's where we are in Imagine. That's the state of play. And uh, love to take any questions either now or after. Ah, Francesco asks about IPMX. I think that IPMX will, um, depending on how quickly it evolves into practical products, will play a role. I think it's a nice set of technologies. Um, IPMX, for people who don't know, is a um, leverages the suite of standards from SMPTE 2110 in order to, um, you know, deliver, uh, you know, kind, uh, think of it as multimedia kind of programming, connecting, you know, computers and displays, connecting mice and keyboards and monitors. Um, it's a little more of an application layer built on top of the 2110 standards targeted for a lot of uh, adjacent markets, but certainly will find a role in television as well. All right, well, thank you all, and thanks for attending. And as I said, feel free to um, you know, chime in. If you see anybody from Imagine, feel free to ask a question or schedule a conversation, hit us up in the chat. Um, we love to meet you here.